Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, four more years of Barack Obama and his friends and enemies in the American media. As for the loser... I'm still rich. He'll be rich. It's business as usual. Another Latin American leader at war with journalists. This time it's Argentina, Christina Kirchner, and a company called Clarín. And the New York Times publishes news on China that Beijing does not consider fit to print. After 18 months of campaigning, endless hours of airtime, and more sound bites than anyone cares to remember, the American electorate has spoken. The U.S. election has made headlines all year, and there are plenty of media angles to explore. The unprecedented amount of money spent on advertising by the official campaigns and their shadowy super PAC surrogates, the increasingly polarized media landscape in the United States, epitomized by Fox News on the right and MSNBC on the left, and then there was the collective insistence on the part of the networks and the pundits they employ that, despite poll after poll showing the incumbent ahead, this was a true horse race much too close to call. Never let the facts or the polling data get in the way of a good story. Our starting point this week is Washington. The re-election of Barack Obama and the prospect of four more years of partisan journalism in a deeply divided America. For all of the coverage, the saturation coverage, all of the debates, news conferences, political rallies, for all of the satellite feeds, flashy graphics, blogs and tweets, the biggest single media moment of an election campaign that cost $3 billion was produced by a single hidden camera that provided a picture of a candidate that the electorate had never really seen, as well as a number, 47%. Mitt Romney's declaration in what he thought was a closed event, but with a camera running, that 47% of the population somehow felt themselves as victims. 47% of Americans pay no income tax. And they were just takers, and he was never going to win them over, so he doesn't care. And it certainly handed Barack Obama and the Democrats a powerful, powerful tool. And so my job is not to worry about those people. These are his donors, the people he's trying to please, and he tells them, I don't care about 47% of the country. I think they're bums. I think they just want to take money from us. That's devastating. It's so hard to recover from that because it gave them an inkling of what the reality is, which is that he did not care about the 47%, even though he was running to be president of the entire country. The reason why I think that moment was important is because by sheer coincidence, it fit with the narrative that Barack Obama and his campaign was trying to build about Mitt Romney. Borrow money if you have to for your parents. And then, lo and behold, emerges a videotape where Mitt Romney fulfills the caricature that the Obama campaign had been building. And frankly, I was born with a silver spoon. Of course, today, things uh, can get proliferated very, very quickly. That video was given to a liberal magazine, Mother Jones, which put it up on its website, and it was immediately put out in millions of tweets and Facebook posts, and so it kind of spread instantly throughout the entire media ecosystem. A perfectly tailor-made moment uh, for today's media age. It's going to be an exciting night, and how close it will be. It was a campaign that had journalists checking their thesauruses for synonyms for the word close. How close is this race, David? To describe an election that compared to the George W. Bush years wasn't really. Was that the media trying to keep viewers interested for the sake of ratings and circulation figures? Or was it just lazy journalism? I do not think there was a false horse race narrative, but there was an overstated horse race narrative. There always is. A horse race always dominates because at the end of the day, it's a campaign. Somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose, and they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to do it. So it isn't a false horse race, but it's an overstated, overemphasized horse race that then drives the coverage. The real disservice is them forcing on the horse race to the exclusion of everything else. Because even if you felt like the campaign's outcome wasn't really in doubt, there's still lots of interesting things that you could write about. You could write about, about policy issues. You can write about the interesting characters. Uh, it doesn't all have to be about uh, everyone's wondering what's going to happen in this state or that state. And the state of the race, even the state of the union itself, can depend largely on which media outlet is delivering the news. The U.S. has news channels that happily reinforce one's ideological beliefs without challenging them. And there are dangers in that. 
MSNBC and Fox has, has created what I call ideological cul-de-sacs for people. If you only want to get a left point of view, you're going to look at MSNBC. If you only want to get a right point of view, you're, all, you're going to look at Fox. Showing Governor Mitt Romney now leads President Obama. The problem is when you're stuck in an ideological cul-de-sac like that, you're not hearing information from the other side. The partisans on both sides tend to be in a kind of information bubble. And that's, I think, may have one of its greatest effects after the campaign. Because if you watch Fox versus MSNBC, for instance, what you see is two entirely different pictures of reality. If you turn on Fox News, Mitt Romney is absolutely sure to win. As far as we can tell, for the first time, Governor Romney's taken the lead there. If you change the channel and you flip over to MSNBC, you'll find exactly the opposite. There's no doubt that Barack Obama is going to win. Uh, with this call in Ohio, it is uh, a done deal. And so after the election is over, the people who are on the side that lost, they're going to be absolutely shocked. They are not going to be able to believe that this happened. and. Part of the consequence of that is that they may think that there is something wrong and they may start to believe in conspiracy theories. So they had this comical moment on Fox News on election night where Karl Rove, who runs a super PAC that spent hundreds of millions of dollars on one side of the campaign, tells Fox News, don't call the election. Do you believe that Ohio has been settled? No, I don't. And it, They'd already called it in favor of President Obama, saying he's been reelected. He says, no, 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 walk that back. Uh, I, I, I have not decided yet that President Obama's won. Ohio. Who cares what you've decided? But Fox News doesn't care about the truth. They care about what does Karl Rove and the Republican Party want us to do. Some of what voters must deal with in the 21st century brand of American politics is new. Don't try and stop the foreclosure process. Let it hit the bottom. The Super PAC adds that raise the temperature and lower the tones. Yay! The news channels that no longer even pretend to offer a balanced view. But in the US, political journalism has always been a contact sport. And this was the Wild West long before television rode into town. American democracy has always been a noise machine. When Thomas Jefferson ran, he had a journalist that was after him for all of his infidelities. When Abraham Lincoln ran, he was accused of being a baboon. When Franklin Roosevelt ran, the press were all over him for potentially wanting to end democracy and capitalism as we know it. American democracy has always been a noise machine. It should be a noise machine because that's what a free society sounds like. The key is to capture it and coordinate it so we don't become only a noise machine and that amid the noise, people can learn and select candidates who at the end of the day have their best interests at heart and who can actually solve problems. Our Global Village Voice is now on the coverage of the U.S. election story. Before the first debate, only the bias of Fox News had kept Republican voters from drowning Mitt Romney's speeches with laughs. After the first debate of the living dead president, only the bias of the New York Times and Network News kept distraught Obama supporters from making bonfires of their yard signs. Bias was the friend of democracy. It gave everyone an excuse to think anything was possible. The media were biased. God bless bias! The U.S. media suffers from a severe case of groupthink, and this was exemplified during this election, particularly with the foreign policy discussion. I mean, the major media outlets only really talked about Iran's nuclear capabilities and Israel. There was no discussion of Europe's financial crisis, about Asia's land disputes, about North Africa and things that were going there. It's kind of astonishing that they spent so much time competing with each other, trying to one-up you know, each other on the same issue. We're always looking for new faces for the program. If you'd like to share your thoughts on the news media, as one of our Global Village voices, you can connect with us on Facebook and Twitter, where we will let you know what stories we're working on. Or you can just get in touch with us via email. We're at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. And don't forget, our free video podcast on iTunes. Just look for the Listening Post Al Jazeera English, and you'll find us there. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. Last week, we looked at investigative journalism in China, how it's a growth industry, but that there are still limits. Well, the New York Times has crossed the line, and Beijing is not pleased. The Times printed an investigation into the wealth of Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao, which alleged that his family has accumulated a fortune worth $2.7 billion during his time in power. 
The piece was reported by the Times' Shanghai correspondent, David Barbosa, and it has led to the banning of the Times' English and Chinese language websites in China. The authorities have also removed references to the story on microblogging sites like Sina Weibo, which is the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. Several users tried to comment on Sina Weibo, but their remarks were quickly deleted. The timing of the news article was intriguing, coming as it did just before the 18th Congress of the ruling Communist Party, which is the biggest event on the Chinese political calendar. A BBC News report was also blacked out by Beijing since it too referred to the story. British Prime Minister David Cameron probably rused the day he learned how to send text messages. Another batch of texts have come to light showing his cozy relationship with one of the key figures arrested over the phone hacking scandal at Rupert Murdoch's British media empire. The texts were between Cameron and Rebecca Brooks, who ran News Corp's British newspaper operation, as well as the now defunct News of the World tabloid. They were published by the Mail on Sunday, had originally been made available to the Levison Inquiry into British Journalism and Politics, but were not released to the public by the Inquiry on the grounds that they were not considered relevant. Opposition Member of Parliament Chris Bryant, himself a victim of phone hacking, says he wants the Inquiry to publish all text messages and emails between the Prime Minister and Ms. Brooks, and he says it should be up to the public to judge their relevance. Here's the official title translated from Russian, The Law on the Protection of Children from Information Detrimental to Their Health and Development. But critics of the Putin government are saying the new law is actually designed to get them. A state blacklist is now in effect in Russia, which bans certain websites. Russians don't know what's on the blacklist because that is secret. Russians don't know who decides which sites should be on the blacklist because the makeup of the panel making those decisions is also secret. The new law gives sites like Google and YouTube three days to take down content that has been banned or face blocking by their ISPs. The Paris-based Press Freedom Group, Reporters Without Borders, says the law gives the appearance of a concerted attack on freedom to disseminate information. We call on members of parliament to revise their proposals in light of the fundamental right to freedom of information, which the Russian constitution and international conventions ratified by Russia guarantee to all citizens. A journalist in Sudan, a woman, has been found alive after allegedly being kidnapped by the Sudanese government's National Intelligence and Security Services, the NISS. So Maya Handusa was found dumped at a roadside outside Khartoum with her head shaved and showing other signs of torture. A family member reportedly received an anonymous text message saying the journalist had been detained by NISS agents and that her captors had shown her article she had written and accused her of disrespecting the government of President Omar al-Bashir. Handusa's family is from Darfur. She covered that story, as well as other touchy subjects in Sudan. The family now says it is planning to file a criminal complaint against unspecified members of the NISS for the attack against the report. The international NGO, the Committee to Protect Journalists, called on the Sudanese government to properly investigate the attack, which it says shows the dangers that journalists in Sudan continue to face if they dare criticize the government. One of the themes we keep coming across here at the Listening Post is the political leader who goes to war with a particular media outlet or organization. We've looked at Venezuela, where Hugo Chavez took on a channel called RCTV, and Turkey, where Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan went after a conglomerate called Doğan Yayan. But you would be hard-pressed to find a more open, overt power struggle than the one taking place in Argentina between President Cristina Kirchner and the Clarín Group. Clarín is Argentina's biggest media player by far. The question is, for how long? In 2009, the Kirchner government pushed through a new media reform law, and the changes it called for are nothing short of drastic. The law is designed to break up media conglomerates, and the target of the legislation was clearly Clarín. What makes many Argentinians uneasy, however, is the notion that President Kirchner is not just out to get Clarín, she simply does not like journalists. Her critics say that freedom of the press is under threat. The Listening Post's Marcela Pizarro now on the legal showdown in Argentina between the government and the country's most powerful media group. This week, Argentines took to the streets to protest President Cristina Kirchner's government. The media were there to cover the story, but they were also very much a part of it. Because one of the things people are protesting 
is their government's approach to media and journalism. President Kirchner is obsessed with the media. She feels that she needs to control everything, and including the media. President Kirchner thinks journalism is a kind of social distortion. She sees journalists as the enemy, and she's convinced journalism represents evil interests. The question is not why does Kirchner avoid the media. The question is how do we get out of a situation in which the media have so much political power. Kirchner knows that the dominant media represents the interests of the private corporate sector. And she's simply trying to change this dynamic. To do that, the president has gone after the most powerful media conglomerate in the country. Clarín controls a whopping 50% of the country's newspaper and magazine circulation, one of the biggest TV networks in the region, as well as radio stations and internet providers. Clarín was once a government ally, but in 2008, the group turned against Kirchner when the government tried raising taxes on landowners. Allegiances ended, battle lines were drawn. Those battle lines ran through sports when the government urged Argentina's Football League to break its contract with the Clarín-owned cable channel, which it did. They also ran through Clarín's internet provider license, which the government got cancelled. And they ran through Argentina's only newsprint manufacturer, partly owned by Clarín, when the government passed a law to tighten control of it. And then in 2009, Kirchner upped the stakes significantly. Her government pushed through a comprehensive legislation designed to permanently reform the media. The new law ruled that the media pie in Argentina should be sliced up into three parts. One third owned by the government, one third owned by private sector companies like Gladin, and one third owned by non-governmental community organizations. People say, well, yes, we all agree. We don't want the media to be in the hands of a monopoly. But in fact, many people started saying, it's not to widen access to ownership that uh, is the real reason behind the law, but simply to dismantle the power of the Clarín Group. What is so good about the media law in Argentina is that it doesn't control content. It accepts pluralism as well as being anti-monopolist. It confronts power, but it also gives others a voice. Because our society knows that to fight for the media law is to fight for the liberation of the word from the hands of groups like Clarín. This new law is just one way Kirchner has tried to undercut dominant media. Another is through Cadenas, party political broadcasts similar to those used by other populist presidents in Ecuador and Venezuela, to take her message beyond mainstream media and straight into Argentine living rooms. The government uses cadenas to get around the dominant media who have historically been the mediators of the official word and used it to serve their own interests. So the government is trying to reformulate its communication strategy to reach a society which receives a distorted reality from the mainstream media on a daily basis. The problem is that talking directly to the public leaves them little choice but to applaud or to leave. It's a bit of an authoritarian way of communicating and people are just forced to listen. And so journalists are important because they are there to ask things that the public can't ask directly. It's that public that's caught in the middle of this media war. One of the big issues is the coverage of the economy. Most Argentines are old enough to remember the bad old days, the hyperinflation of the late 80s, the economic crisis of 2001. So it's in the Argentine DNA to fear a run on the banks and the government says irresponsible financial reporting could provoke one. Last year, Kirchner pushed through a law that threatens journalists with jail time for sensationalist economic reporting. There was nothing subtle about the law. It's called La Ley Antiterrorista, the anti-terrorism law. People are only reporting what they believe to be the truth or reality. If somebody decides that something they published was the cause 
for a run on deposits, they could be then accused uh, under the anti-terrorist law. That is very frightening. El Grupo Clarín. Clarín has absolute command of the media sphere and has the power to incite crises. At the moment, the government is restricting people from withdrawing dollars from the banks. It's a policy aimed at keeping the economy stable. But by publishing front page stories about a potential dollar crisis, Clarín has the power to create a self fulfilling prophecy. The media have been fighting back, and leading the charge is Jorge Lanata, one of Argentina's most famous and most opinionated journalists. Recently, he invited 200 reporters onto the set of his show, Periodismo para Todos, Journalism for All, as part of a campaign for more access to public information. Kirchner's crusade against journalists is part of a basic concept in Latin America which is known as 21st century socialism. Hugo Chavez has created something similar. They think that journalism always represents the interests of the oligarchy and that those interests are always economic. This is a very stereotyped idea of the media. No one who has ever worked in the media could think that there is just one voice. It's impossible. However, it has suited Christina Kirchner to make it seem that way. The demonstrators on the streets of Buenos Aires know that on December the 7th, her government will take Clarín to court in a legal case the entire country will be following. The case is all about democracy, or it's about freedom of expression, depending on who you believe, which side you're on. More Global Village voices now on the battle between Kirchner and Clarín. The situation in Argentina today is that the media has become completely biased, either in favor or against President Fernandez and her government. Clarín have jumped on every chance to criticize the government in general and the president in particular. As a result, other media outlets, both public and private, have either been forced or felt the need to unconditionally support the president. They've abandoned their objectivity and used the same tactics as Clarín. The result is that today Argentines have no mass media outlet to turn to if they are looking for unbiased, objective political news. The media law passed by Argentina's Congress in 2009 is good news for Argentina's democracy because it is a fine piece of legislation that tries to make a monopolistic market more diverse. The government, however, is finding some difficulties in fully implementing the bill. The government is focusing too much on its short-term goal of downsizing its main political media rival, which is Grupo Clarín. We'll end with one final note on the U.S. presidential election. Barack Obama is looking at another four years of White House briefings, news conferences, photo opportunities, and sparring with Fox News. As for the loser, Mitt Romney, here's how the Gregory brothers of Brooklyn, New York, see the future of a candidate who complained that the media were putting words in his mouth. Our web video of the week is one more musical example of that. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. You may think I'm overcome with torment and depression Symptoms common to the loser of a big election But not me, you see I've got a secret weapon That keeps me happy and gay I'm still rich Filthy rich as far as I'm concerned, this election thing went off without a hitch. Now I'll have the best tax write-offs I could ever get. Well, he has nothing to get and blame for the U.S. going to H-E double hockey sticks. Oh, life's a bitch. Wake up, it ain't for me, cause I'm still rich. Take it away, boys. Oh, I never really wanted that low-wage president job to paint my career. Besides, who on earth could possibly get by on $400,000 a year? Now that I'm done pretending to have fun spending time with the plebeians, my speaking fee will multiply by three, so if you ask me, we won. I'm still horse riding, company acquiring, income hiding, employee firing, luxury yacht buying rich. Thanks, guys. Let's give it up for the Mitt Romney Tabernacle Dixieland Band. Wow.